welcome to Grapple Arts Radio. Hi there. This is Stefan Kesting and the Grapple Arts Radio Podcast. It's a busy time of year, my friends. There's uh, so much to do leading up to Christmas. Am I allowed to say Christmas? Well, whatever it is that turns your crank. The festival season. I hope it's going to be a good one for you. I am working on a couple of things. I'm working on a couple of new projects. I'm working on some individual projects, instructional projects, and I'm also working on some collaborative projects with friends and some really cool people. Don't want to say too much about it so far, just that it's coming. There's some interesting stuff coming, and if you're signed up for my email newsletter, then you'll be among the first people to find out. It's probably the most reliable way to stay in touch with everything that's going on at the Grapple Arts headquarters. One other thing that I'm getting ready for as well, and it does cut into my jiu-jitsu training a little bit, is getting ready for the death march. A friend and I seem to be doing this every six months, which is, uh, it's a trail. It's a trail called the Nienacker, or the race is called the Nienacker. It goes along the baden Powell Trail here in the North Shore Mountains. So it's 50 kilometers or 30 miles through mountain terrain, going up and down and up and down and up and down, and there's a lot of it's in the snow, typically in the winter. So you got a total of five kilometers or about three miles of up and down in addition to the 50 kilometers or 30 miles of horizontal. The last winter it took more than 17 hours to do it with an awesome four hours of post holing through the snow initially. Then the summer we got it down to 12. The scary thing is there's bloody people out there doing it in just four and a half hours. Now sure, that's in the middle of summer. Sure, they've got support as opposed to us who are doing it unsupported, but it's still insane. When I'm going there and I'm hiking as fast as I can across gnarly roots and rocks and slippery wet conditions to think that there's some idiot out there who can charge along, essentially running as fast as I can run on level ground over incredibly broken terrain. It just goes to show how much further people can go in any discipline. I mean, we, we take it for granted that if you were to play with an NBA basketball player, that he would kick your ass. I've never done that, but I have friends who play hockey. I don't play hockey. I'm a very bad Canadian. But I have friends who play hockey, and they've played against NHL guys, and they just talk about there being another level, right? These are guys who are pretty damn good in their, you know, in their beer leagues, and, you know, they used to maybe even play junior hockey back in the day, and then they go out and play against somebody really good, and they just get their asses handed to them. So it's amazing how there's always another level of skill in every endeavor, whether it's jiu-jitsu, you know, lots and lots. There you have black belts. Then you have competitive black belts for the high-level championships. And then you've got the world champions. And it's, it's night and day, each level that you go up. And it's, it's kind of amazing. You know, it's not like the high-level world-class black belt will beat the recreational black belt nine times out of ten, it'll almost be 99 times out of 100, especially if, you know, say the recreational black hole's got one really good move. Say he's a great ankle locker. Yeah, you might catch that guy once and then never, ever again. So that's one thing that I'm getting ready for. Like I said, the knee knacker, it just seems that doing something like that every six months is a really nice fitness calibration. It's a nice goal to work up towards. It, uh, you know, it does consume much of the month before <laughs> the two days after when I can barely move but it really helps focus the training the conditioning it, it gives you a reason I don't need a, a big race or a big competition to train but even so it's really nice to have a, a goal and a reason to to go out and focus on one thing more than something else as soon as it's done I'll probably focus a bit more on weight training up my jiu-jitsu a little bit I mean to be honest with you, I can't do as much jiu-jitsu in the last month as I normally do leading up to one of these uh, death marches because I need to spend my limited time focusing on sport-specific training. For sure, there's carryover between jiu-jitsu and other activities. There's carry you know, If you do jiu-jitsu, you'll be stronger in the gym than somebody who's not trained at all. You won't be as strong as a gym rat, but you'll be stronger than somebody else who's your age and your weight and your your demographic. If you do jiu-jitsu, you'll have better cardio, you'll have better endurance than somebody who doesn't do anything. It won't be as good as a professional runner or a full-time runner, 
but it'll still be better. So there is carryover for sure, but at a certain point, you need to buckle down and say, okay, I want to do really well at this 10K race, say. I better spend this last month really focusing on that. I'm getting ready for, I don't know, a powerlifting competition. I better spend some time doing more powerlifting and less jujitsu. Jujitsu will be there for you when you get back. So taking these little breaks, not even breaks, not even layoffs, just reduce training frequencies once in a while. It's all right. Everybody does it. We have this idea that the top level guys spend all their time doing jujitsu, and it might be true for some of them, but I also know lots of fighters, lots of MMA guys, lots of judo players who take pretty big blocks of time off. Now that blocks of time off might just mean reduced training intensity, but they're not going balls out, you know, three training sessions a day and conditioning all the time because they can't. Their bodies would break down. So there are definitely slacker, easier periods in their in their training cycle. So I guess the take home message here is if there comes a time when you can't train as much because you have to focus on something else, don't worry. Like the cyclical ebb and flow of training, it, it's normal. To some degree, everybody goes through it. If nothing else, because of injury, right? You get banged up, you got to take some time off or that injury will never heal. So people lose their minds because they think that, oh my God, I can't train this week or for the next two weeks. Well, jiu-jitsu is not a sprint. Jiu-jitsu is a marathon. Right? you got to look at this as a 10-year training endeavor. And over 10 years, you know, that's sort of the average time it takes to get your black belt. Over 10 years, there are going to be times when you're not training as much, and there going to be times when you're training more. Just embrace it. It's part of the sport. In today's podcast, I want to talk about two related things. The first is a talk about jiu-jitsu and adversity, how jiu-jitsu can prepare you for adversity in life. The second somewhat related topic is from a YouTube video that I shot talking about what to do for people whose mind completely goes blank. So the first part of the podcast, talking about jiu-jitsu and adversity, that's recorded just as a podcast. The second part, if you want to see me talk, there's a, a YouTube video out there titled something like what to do when your mind goes blank when you're sparring or when you're rolling. It'll be on my website as well. You can watch it there or you can listen to it here because it's just a talking head video. It's just me running my mouth about this topic that I feel like I have some valuable input for. So the first thing is jiu-jitsu and adversity. And the thing that got me thinking about this is I realized that in the past couple of months, I've heard two jiu-jitsu black belts say almost exactly the same thing, despite the fact that they live on opposite sides of the continent. And they were going through some tough times. One guy was having difficulties with his school. Another guy was having problems of a, of a different nature. And their comments were both the same. It's like, yeah, it's tough right now, tough right now. But I know what I have to do. It might, not, it's, it might not work, but I know what I have to do. And then here's the really cool part. They both compared it to being on the bottom of Mount. They basically said, it's just like being trapped on the bottom of Mount against a really good opponent. You know what you need to do. You need to keep your hands up. You need to keep your elbows in. You need to make some kind of posture. You need to set up your escapes. You need to not get tapped out and you need to try and get out. It may not work. It may not work. You may still get tapped out, but it doesn't change the things that you have to do. You have to do the things that you've trained to do a thousand times and not, you know, let it all go out the door and not forget about it all, you need to, whatever your best mount escape is, you need to try and do it, you need to go through the steps, and you need to try and pull it off. Similarly, uh, my friend who was having financial problems with his school knew what he needed to do. He needed to grow his school. He needed to cut costs, he needed to bring new students in, and he needed to find a way to not have the place go bankrupt. He used the analogies, just like being on the bottom of Mount. You know what you have to do. He knew what he had to do. Would it work? Would the school go under? Well, it hasn't gone under since. But panicking and losing your mind and going blank and, and freaking out isn't going to help his school survive. It's also not going to help you get out of the bottom of Mount. 
if you're going through a tough time, you're going through a divorce. Now, that's the thing a lot of people go through, and it's devastating. You take a look at what the pain points are. Okay, maybe you're losing your place to live. Maybe half your income is getting garnished. Maybe you've got to hire a lawyer. Maybe you've got to fight it on court. Hopefully not, but if those are the things that you need to do, you go and do them. You kind of rationally consider what are the problems, what are the solutions, and how am I going to implement those solutions. There is a, a term in the fire service called PST, Problems, Solutions, and Tactics. Right, So you pull up at a big burning building and there are people on the balconies and there are flames coming out of the roof and there is traffic all over the place you know, threatening to run over your firefighters and there's a building next to the building that's on fire that's about to catch on fire as well. So what are the problems? You take a look at the problems. Well, I've got the problem of rescue. There are people hanging off the balconies. There is the fire. There is a traffic problem, and there's the exposure problem. The other building is about to catch on fire. Let's just, for the sake of argument, keep it to those four problems. What are the solutions? Well, the solution to the people hanging off the balconies is might be to get ladders up to those balconies. The problem to the fire, you might choose to ignore that for a little bit, or you might choose to put it out. So one solution would be to try and extinguish it. Another would be to try and contain it, to confine it so that it doesn't spread. For the sake of argument, just to keep things really simple, we'll say putting it out is the solution that we deal with, that we, that we choose today. What's the problem with uh, cars whizzing by our fire trucks? Well, it might be to call the cops and get them to set up traffic control. You know, we need some kind of traffic control. What's the problem to the building, or what's the solution to the problem of the building next door about to catch on fire from brands going through the air? Well, it might be to set up an exposure team to try and drench those buildings. So we've got four problems, we've got four general solutions, and then the tactics is who actually does this? It's really granular. Who is going to put up those ladders? Well, it's going to be Fred and George from Engine 1. Fred, George, put up ladders to those balconies. Or it might be, uh, you know, the two next incoming rigs. Engine 1, Engine 2, we need you to ladder those balconies, right? So you've got the problem, you've got the solution, you've got the specific implementation, the tactic for that. For the, for the fire, if we're going to extinguish it, we're going to send a, a, a couple of teams indoors, right? Okay, I'm going to take the next two rigs that are coming in, and I'm going to say, you guys handle the interior attack. You guys organize yourselves. I'm still in charge of the overall incident, but you know it's going to be engine three and engine four taking care of the interior attack. The traffic that's going around, we're going to get the cops to do that. So the cops are going to implement the solution to the problem of traffic. What about the other building catching on fire? The exposure. How are we going to solve that problem? Who's going to be responsible for implementing the solution? Well, how many other vehicles do we have coming in? Do we have engine five? Okay, engine five, you guys go do it. Do we need to call in some fire trucks from another municipality? They'll go do it. So it's making a list of your problems, looking at the overall solution, and then tasking out the implementation of those solutions. It doesn't need to all be you. So in the case of your divorce, you know, you're not going to go to court most likely. You're going to get your lawyer to do that. So you'll task him to do that. You know, you might you might be responsible for some of your solutions. Somebody else can be responsible for some of those other solutions. Really, it's just staying calm, realizing that almost any problem you have, there are solutions to them. Are you willing to pay the price to do those solutions? Well, that's sometimes the problem. In any case, once you've done jiu-jitsu, and <laughs> once you've been trapped on the bottom of a mount with some 300-pound black belt who's super good at collar chokes, who's trying to choke the life out of you, you know, once you're comfortable in that position, then staying calm, making a list of your problems, your solutions, and your tactics, for dealing with the overall general problem is not so hard. You know what you have to do. You know what you have to do. You just have to make a list of things and then start picking them off one by one. Jiu-Jitsu is moment by moment problem solving. It's problem solving at the most 
visceral level because your body thinks it's in a fight for its life. So then when it comes to other things, you know, you've got a deadline at work. You need to have this presentation ready. Well, what are your problems? What are the solutions? And how are you going to implement those solutions? Who's responsible for implementing those solutions? Jiu-Jitsu is a fantastic training ground for dealing with crisis. It's desensitizing you to crisis. It's desensitizing you to that adrenal fight or flight reflex. It's learning to harness that and not lose your mind, not lose all your fine motor skill, lose bowel control, lose all kinds of other control that you don't want to lose. You have to learn to deal with adversity in jiu-jitsu, and I think it translates super well to dealing with adversity in the rest of your life. Certainly, my two black belt friends who are, came up with the same metaphor, it's like this is just like being trapped on the bottom of mount, they'd come to realize that jiu-jitsu is a training ground for problems that have nothing to do with jiu-jitsu. So I think that's a really useful thing to think about. It's a good reason to continue training jiu-jitsu when you're discouraged, when things are going not so well, when you're getting your ass kicked, when you're in a big slump, or even worse, when you've been at a plateau for a while. Just going in there and grinding. You know what you need to do. You need to figure out what your problems are. I'm getting my guard passed. That's the problem. So that's the overall big problem. Now we'll take a look at the sub problems, right? Like I'm getting murdered on the mat. That's the overall emergency. What are the individual problems? Well, I'm getting my guard passed. Also, I'm not very good at getting out of side mount. Also, I don't have any answers for when the guy sets up the arm bar from side mount. Okay, so those are my three problems. Well, you're probably already thinking about solutions. So let's look at why my guard's getting passed. Oh, I'm not fighting for grips. My opponent is controlling grips. Therefore, the solution is to grip fight. The tactics are the specific techniques. How do I get rid of the grip on the collar? How do I get rid of the grip on the pants? How do I get rid of the grip on the sleeve? How do I prevent those grips in the first place? I don't have any side mount escapes. What are the solutions? Develop at least two good side mount escapes. What are the tactics? The tactics are, I'm going to work on the, uh, the shrimp and the underhook bridge and coming up to a low single side mount escapes, say, or whatever other escapes you want to work on. It doesn't matter. You just pick two and you work them and you drill them and you drill them. And that's how you're, those are the tactics to solve the problem, right? You've got your problem, your solution, your solving, and your specific tactics. Same for the armbar. I need to learn two good armbar escapes. Which armbar escapes am I going to drill? Okay, so now I've got the overall problem, I'm getting armbar, solution, develop armbar escapes, tactic, I'm going to work on the hitchhiker escape, and I'm going to work on getting to my knees and stacking my opponent and crushing him. So the exact same process can be applied to many, many different areas of life, and I'm 100% convinced that jiu-jitsu is one of the very best ways to train yourself to deal with that adversity. What we're going to do now is we're going to splice in the audio from that YouTube video talking about what to do when your mind goes blank on the mat, why does your mind go blank on the mat sometimes, and what to do when it does. What are the problems, what are the solutions, and how do you implement them for that problem. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the next segment as well. Take care. Hi, I'm Stephen Casting from grapplers.com, and today we're going to talk about what to do when your mind goes completely blank when you're rolling or competing in jiu-jitsu. Now, this is a pretty common problem, actually. I have a lot of friends who've experienced this, especially in the first couple of years of training, and I get up emails and Facebook messages and tweets, and people come to me all the time with this same question, basically some variation of, there I was rolling, and my mind keeps on going completely blank, and I can't think of what to do next. So, first thing to know, this is a common problem, Second thing to know, that the solution to this depends a little bit on what's causing the problem. So in this video, we're going to go over about seven solutions or seven problems. And the solutions are related to the problems. So if you have problem A, then you're going to go with mostly solution A. If you have problem B, you're mostly going to go with solution B. So if you have this problem, 
it's probably very frustrating. It's probably worth watching this entire video and seeing which of these problems and solutions apply to you. And hopefully by the end of it, you have a couple of concrete points that you can actually use and apply in your own training to get over this super irritating thing of just not having any clue what to do as the guy passes your guard, smashes you, arm bars you, and you tap out yet again. So let's talk really generally. If you're having a problem of your mind going blank, maybe it's just that your mind isn't going fast enough, right? Like you're there and the person's got grips on your legs and they're about to pass your guard during a Toriando or doing some guard pass, doesn't matter what it is. If you had an infinite amount of time, if you could sit there for 10 minutes and go, hmm, his grips are there, so he's probably going to go this way or that way, I should probably do X, Y, Z to counter it. If you had that much time, you probably could come up with an answer so your mind wouldn't be blank. So part of the problem could be that you're not making decisions fast enough. So there are two solutions here. The most obvious one is mat time. Usually this is a problem that beginners have and they're like, I don't know what to do. Well, of course you don't know what to do. You've only been doing jujitsu for a couple of months or you started jujitsu, you got fairly good and then you took a layoff for whatever reason. Now you're coming back and you still expect yourself to be at that same level and your actual ability to execute has gone way down. So too many options, right? You're rolling and you don't know whether you should do a guard sweep or a submission or a triangle choke or an omoplata or a switch a spider guard or inside, upside down, de la Hiva or whatever. So solution number one is really limit your game. The less choices you have to choose between, the faster you're going to make that decision. If you go to a buffet table and there are two things, there's an apple there and there's a pear, you're going to choose whichever one you like most. Hmm, I feel like an apple. If there are 25 fruit there, you're going to take a while to choose in between. The more choices you have, the longer it takes you to make that decision. This has been scientifically validated in a whole bunch of different contexts, ranging from law enforcement shoot, no shoot decisions to people buying stuff to, you know, make choice when they look at internet dating data. And it applies to jujitsu. The simpler your game, the faster you're going to make your decision. So the very easiest thing to do is say, look, Fred, your training partner's name is Fred. Look, Fred, all I wanted to do today is to work on my guard retention. If you're going to start my guard, you're going to try and pass my guard, I'm going to stop you from block, from passing my guard. Maybe you've only got one or two things you're going to do. Number one, I'm going to grip fight like crazy. Number two, I'm going to use a frame and hip escape. That's it. That's my whole game plan. You're only going to do two things. You'll be able to stick to your game plan quite well because you don't have a whole lot of things to choose from. And if he passes your guard and pins you for a few seconds, you go back. So the stress of having to choose between all options in all of jiu-jitsu is gone. You're only choosing between two options. Same thing applies to rear mount. You might go, I'm going to go to rear mount and all I'm going to do is focus on staying on the strong side and going for the rear naked choke. That's it. If I'm rear mount and rear mount mount, we reset. You might go, I'm only going to go for guard passes. I'm going to go for an X pass. That's it. I'm only going to go for an X pass. And that's the only guard pass I'm going to go for. Your partner, your training partner, meanwhile, gets the benefits of having extremely focused training coming his way. And he's going to get really good at shutting down the X pass or shutting down the rear mount attack or uh, passing your guard. So it's beneficial to both parties. So number one, limit your game. Kind of a related thing here is having a game plan. You know, a game plan is really just a couple of techniques that fit together extremely well. Perfect case in point, Bernardo Faria. Bernardo Faria is very knowledgeable. He's got a lot of different techniques. Look at his competition. How many techniques does he actually use in competition? 80% of the time, it's his basic deep half guard sweep where he feeds the lapel, stands up, single legs the guy, and then he goes directly into the over-under and passes the guard. So you know, he's got lots of other techniques, but his basic game plan is deep half guard sweep into over-under pass to side mount domination. You take a look at other fighters, Marcelo Garcia. You know, he uses the arm drag. He uses the single leg X sweep. He uses the butterfly sweep. He uses the X guard. It's not all techniques. He doesn't do spider guard. 
He doesn't do reverse De La Hiva. He doesn't do deep half guard. Well, you see him in it once in a while. I'm sure he knows it, but that's not his game plan. A guy who really spelled out this game plan development very well is Brandon Mullins because he, in his uh, How to Defeat the Bigger, Stronger Opponent Series 2, takes us through his basic top game game plan and his basic close guard game plan. So it's not always going to go according to that game plan, but the whole idea of start with technique number one. If that doesn't work, go to technique number two. If that doesn't work, go to technique number three is a really powerful thing because it stops your mind from going blank. If I'm close guard, I know what I should do. Technique one. And if that doesn't work, what? Technique two. You're not thinking about it. You're not going, what are all the techniques that I've ever seen on YouTube? What are all the techniques that uh, my teachers ever showed me? What are all the techniques I've ever dreamed up in the shower? And now let me choose between one of those 75 techniques? No, you're limiting your game. So picking just a few techniques to work is sort of the first level of answer to your mind going blank when you're sparring. The second level is developing a game plan. It's a little bit more advanced because you need to know how techniques fit together. But by the time you're high white, low blue, you know, medium blue, you should be beginning to think about building a half decent game plan to get you through the next couple of years of training and just see what works together. You know, see what works for you and see what techniques fit together extremely well. Now we're going to look at some of the more specific causes of mental blankness, of blanking out, of not having a clue what to do. So the next thing is one of my major hobby horses, which is conditioning. I think it was Vince Lombardi said fatigue makes cowards of us all. Doesn't only make us cowards, makes us idiots. Makes us forget everything we ever learned. If you're exhausted, then the other guy's always a step ahead. You're going to see what's happening. Oh, he's going for an over underpass. I should counter that by, oh, too late because he's in side mount. <sighs> I should escape side mount by doing, oh, it's too late. He's already got mount. Hmm. I should escape mount. I know what to do. I should do, oh, he got me in an arm bar. So if you're exhausted, you think slowly. You, you become an idiot. So the obvious answer there is more mat time and more conditioning. The mat time gives you conditioning. And if you don't have time to get more mat time in, then do more cardio. In fact, at the end of this video, I'm going to throw a little Snapchat thing that I shot the other day while doing my weekly cardio and just commenting about how the cardio that I'm doing, the increased levels of cardio, are really helping my jiu-jitsu game. So my mind isn't quite going blank, but the more cardio I do, the faster I think. And the faster you think, the less likely your mind is to go blank. Related to conditioning is people with good conditioning who completely screw it up by holding their breath. So they might be in great shape, but now they get stressed out, um, then they hold their breath, and then they're exhausted, and we know what happens when you're exhausted, your mind goes blank, or you think so slowly that your mind might as well be blank. So if you're having this problem, monitor yourself very closely and see if you might be holding your breath or alternately breathing really shallow, <sighs> not deep. filling your whole lungs and exhaling. If you're having this problem or if people are telling you that you're holding your breath, sometimes you gotta ask your training partners, hey man, when we're sparring, can you keep an eye out for me holding my breath? And if he says, yeah, you're holding your breath, you're breathing really shallow, then forget about technique, forget about tactics, forget about strategy, forget about game plans. Your only goal, your only job for the next month or two is to make sure that you're breathing. When you're on the mats, Every three seconds, check in with yourself. Am I still breathing? Oh no, I'm beginning to hold my breath. It's really a common thing and it's easy to fix once you put your focus on it. So you're gonna there, you sweep a guy, check. Am I breathing? Oh yeah, I'm breathing. Okay, I do a move. I do a move. In fact, one very easy way to get around this is every time you move, take a breath or take a big deep breath and then move. Take a big deep breath get a grip. Take a big deep breath, get a second grip. <sighs> Take a big deep breath, start moving to the back. It's kind of simplistic, but initially it's, it's a tactic, it's a heuristic that'll get you through the fight and make sure that you're breathing, which will make sure you don't get exhausted, which will make sure that your mind doesn't go blank. Another possible culprit for your mind going completely blank when you're sparring 
is if you suffer from claustrophobia. If you suffer from claustrophobia, you probably know it. We're not talking about like the discomfort you feel when somebody's there kneeling on your face trying to crush your head into the mat. We're talking about when you get on bottom and the person closes the distance, you have raw, visceral panic. You, know, you panic and your mind goes blank and all you feel is the desire to die or vanish from the spot. If that's you, then there is a solution. If that's not you, then you know jump ahead in the video by a couple of minutes and get to the next problem. But if you suffer from claustrophobia, the key is progressive desensitization. And yes, you can deal with it. If you have super severe claustrophobia, like you just lose your mind anytime somebody's within an inch or two of you, the odds of you having even started jujitsu are incredibly small. And the odds of you watching this video are even smaller. So you're probably not an extreme case. You're probably a moderate to mild case which is fairly common. Why do I think claustrophobia is fixable? Well, a long time ago on Grapple Arts, I wrote an article about claustrophobia in BJJ. You should go and find it. If you suffer from this, do a search for Grapple Arts, claustrophobia, BJJ, you'll find it. In that article, a lot of grapplers shared their experiences of gradually getting over it, desensitizing themselves to proximity. It is possible. I've seen it done. I've seen it done by even some really good jiu-jitsu competitors who would lose their minds initially when they were on their bottom, even MMA fighters. Now, the bonus here is that those people that I'm thinking of develop really good guards because they hated people passing their guards and really good escapes. They were super hard to hold down because you know they, they had learned to deal with the claustrophobia, but in that process, they had also made sure that their escapes and their guard retention was killer. So they kind of developed a superpower as a result of this super problem. Like I said, the key is progressive desensitization. You might do things like go on the bottom and have somebody hold you for five seconds and then take a break. And then five seconds and then take a break. Next week, go to 10 seconds. It might seem silly, but this stuff really does work. I knew the one MMA guy that I'm thinking of would go to jiu-jitsu class. At the end of jiu-jitsu class, he'd take his gi, which is just soaked, and he'd lie down on the mat put the gi over his face and just, you know, set a timer and try and last two, three, four minutes, longer and longer each time, just to get used to the sensation of being smothered, the sensation of not being able to breathe. And it really helped him. He did build up a tolerance over time. It was progressive desensitization. Go check out that article if this applies to you. Another time that people get really frustrated with their minds going blank is when they did used to train, they developed a certain level of skill and a certain level of expectations about their ability to perform, and then for whatever reason, an injury, they had a child, their spouse had a child, they had a big project at work, they were in jail, whatever, they had to take some time off, and then they're coming back to it. So sort of technically, they're still up there. They might have gotten up to a two-stripe white belt, but then they took a year off or six months off, and now they're nowhere near two-stripe white belt in terms of execution ability. They might still remember the techniques. Oh yeah, that's an armbar. Oh yeah, that's an Americana. Oh yeah, that's a Kimura. But their ability to pull it off in real time against somebody who's really in their face and moving is much, much lower than it was initially. So what they've done is they've forgotten when they came in you know, a year ago, they started here. They were Their minds were blank. They had no idea what to do because they were beginners. Then they got a little bit better and they knew what to do. Over time, that degraded. Now they're kind of in that beginner state again, but they don't think they should be there. They think they should remember what to do. And that can be super frustrating and super discouraging. So the answer there clearly is mat time. Mat time and not being too hard on yourself. If you've taken a long layoff, it's going to take you a while to get back in shape. Sorry, it's true. I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but I bet it's something like for each month that you take off, it's going to take you a week of hard training to bring your technical level back up to where it was. That's assuming your conditioning didn't drop off. If your conditioning dropped off as well, if all you did was sit on the couch and eat Doritos, it's going to take longer than that. It might take two or three weeks to come back up. Just go easy on yourself. Let's say you got up to mid blue belt and, uh, then you take a long time off. Now you come back and now you can barely hang with, you know, mid-level white belts. Well, that's super frustrating, but the advantage is they're going to improve, but you're going to improve much faster because you've already been higher than that. You've already been to mid-blue. So take heart, don't freak out, go easy on yourself, and more mat time for that problem. 
The next factor is a really interesting one. It's actually twofold. So the first is people who can hang with people their own level and hang with lower belts, but then have their mind completely go blank when they're fighting higher level guys. So let's argument to say argument to say it's a good blue belt. He can fight other good blue belts and you know make plans and respond in the moment. But then when he fights brown belts and black belt, his mind just goes blank. So he's putting a lot of stress on himself to do as well and pull off his moves against somebody who's much better than him. Objectively much better. The reason that a brown belt can kick a blue belt's ass most of the time is because jiu-jitsu works. If jiu-jitsu didn't work, if it was imaginary martial arts, if it was Tai Chi or something, then there's no real difference in compatibility ability between somebody who's been doing it for five years and somebody who's been doing it for one year, if we're really honest about it. However, with jiu-jitsu, somebody who's a brown belt should be able to kick the ass of somebody who's a blue belt almost all the time, unless there's some mitigating circumstances, injury, giant weight difference, giant size difference, good luck, or, you know, the, brown, the blue belt had a ton of good luck, or that there was a massive amount of sandbagging on the part of the blue belt. He's actually been training for 12 years and had a you know, black belt in judo and a wrestling background in high school. Oh yeah, I'm a blue belt. So we're not counting that. So if you're a lower belt who blanks out against upper belts, listen, don't worry about it. They're supposed to beat you. In fact, here's what you do. Just take your best techniques and try and work them. If your best technique is a scissor sweep from guard, try and use that scissor sweep from guard against that black belt or against that brown belt with, you know, complete commitment. Try and pull it off. It probably won't work, but it's okay. Let's say you off balance him or get him worried and then he reacts in passage guard and kills you. That's okay. You got him worried. Just go out there, relax, use your best techniques and, and be ready to tap out. It's no big deal. The more you tap out, the more you learn. The second case of a skill discrepancy leading to the mind going blank is really interesting. This is where people do okay against people their own level or upper belts, but blank out against people just a little bit worse than them or much lower than them. And that's a weird one. But what's going on there is somebody's, you know, mid-level blue belt, say, and they can hang, you know, with the, you know, they can hang sort of fight a while before tapping out to, say, the purple belt. But, you know, they can there, they can be scheming, they can be formulating plans. But when they're fighting just a new blue belt, oh my God. And what's going on there is they're so invested in not looking like an idiot, in not tapping out to somebody who's lower than them, in not uh, showing their instructor that they're a fraud, that they, they essentially panic. I've run into this a few times. And uh, it's a strange one, but it exists. Man, all I can say there is don't worry about it. As I film this video, the last person that I've tapped out to in sparring is a purple belt. So I'm a relatively large, rather experienced black belt. This was a pretty good purple belt, but I'm bigger than him and I'm heavier than him. And uh, in some ways I'm stronger than him. He's pretty strong, but in some ways I'm stronger than him. So I was trying a, a starting in a position on the bottom kind of disadvantageous, but I had a plan and I was just drilling that position and I swept him. I made a mistake in positioning my arm, scooted around to my back, got the collar choke, choked me. I tapped, we moved back to sparring and I did my best to get my revenge. Standard jiu-jitsu practice. But did I lose my mind about tapping to somebody who's uh, not a black belt? No, not at all. It's all part of the game. It's part of the game if you're doing any kind of experimenting, if you're doing any kind of exploring, there's that old saying, you know, if you ain't flying, you ain't trying. Well, how about this? If you ain't tapping out, then you're not exploring enough. If you ain't tapping out, then you're not trying enough new things. If you ain't tapping out, then you're, you're not opening your game up. And if you don't open your game up and try things that are outside your comfort zone, then you're not going to grow. Growth comes from going into uncomfortable areas. This is being sound like a self-help video, but it, let's put it back into jiu-jitsu. Growth comes from tapping out. The more you tap out, the more you learn. Don't worry about, you know, losing occasionally to the lower belts. All it means is that you're experimenting. All it means is that you're training. All it means is that you're not purely staying in your A game and crushing everyone who's lower than you. That's not the way to go. That's not the way to grow. So just to recap quickly, if your mind goes blank when you're sparring, when you're competing, try training for a little while, 
with a super limited game, essentially doing positional sparring. I'm going to start in the bottom of side mount and get out. And if I get out, I'm going to stop. We're going to stop. And I'm going to go back into the bottom of side mount. That's an example of positional sparring. We're going to start in my open guard. And if you pass my open guard and pin me, we're going to stop, reset, go back into the open guard. Also, try working on a game plan. A game plan limits the total number of techniques that you're using and uses techniques that fit together really well. That is something that can often give you an idea of what the next step in the progression is going to be. If you build game plans for positions, good and bad, then you'll know what the next thing is that you should be doing. It may not work, but you know what the next thing is that you have to be doing. The next thing is to work on your cardio. Maybe your mind's going blank because you're exhausted. Work on your cardio and get more mat time. In fact, mat time is probably ultimately the answer to all of this, but you know, we're talking about some of the shortcuts. So sometimes working on your conditioning, specifically your cardio, can really help your mind going blank because it means you're not as tired. And if you're not as tired, then you're thinking faster. If you're thinking faster, then your brain's probably not going to be drawing a blank when you encounter a new position. Related to that, make sure you're breathing. Do not hold your breath because if you hold your breath, you're going to get exhausted and then you go back to being an idiot, right? Fatigue makes idiots of us all. If it's claustrophobia that's causing you to completely blank out, work on that. Go read that article. Work on some kind of progressive desensitization to it. You will get better. I've seen so many people make big improvements in this area, so I know it can be done. If you're coming back from a long layoff, go easy on yourself. Maybe use some of the other strategies. Maybe use some limited sparring, you know, positional sparring. Maybe really work on game plan development. But realize that you're going to suck for a while. And it's going to take a while to get back to where you were. You can't leave a sport and then come back to it six months later or a year later and expect to be you know, firing on all cylinders. It's going to take a while. And that's perfectly okay. And people at the club should know it. Nobody should be giving you grief for uh, you know, not knowing what to do after a long layoff. So just keep at it. Don't, don't worry about it. And you'll be okay. And finally, when it comes to problems of drawing a blank, when there's a skill discrepancy, either people who are better than you or people that are not as good as you, listen, don't worry about it. It's really not a big deal. When you're sparring, you're not defending the honor of jiu-jitsu. You're not defending the honor of the school. You're not defending the honor of your instructor. Everybody taps. If you're not tapping, then you're either not training or you're only fighting people that you know you can beat. And that's not a way to get better. The more you tap, the more, the more you learn. So put yourself in positions where you're going to tap out and you'll continue to grow. I hope some of this helped. If you have other experiences with your mind going blank or if some of this helped, or if you have suggestions for other people who've been through this, leave them in the comments below. I know people read those comments and somebody who's interested in this topic and is watching this video could really benefit from you sharing your experience because maybe you'll say something that resonates with them and will help them, you know, catapult them out of that mental blankness state, which is so frustrating. Anyway, take care. Good luck with your training. 